Psalm 100 says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing, know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth through all generations. Now come and join us for worship.
morning, Bates family and friends. My name is Reverend Walter Holder, Jr. I am the Associate Pastor of Congregational Care and Family Life Connections here at the Bates Memorial Baptist Church. As you know, our theme for this year has been called to be faithful. And I don't know if you feel this way or not, but ever since I've been here at the Bates Memorial Baptist Church, I have seen nothing but the best demonstration of love and faithfulness from my own pastor, Dr. F. Bruce Williams, and his wife, Dr. Michelle Williams. Having said that, I want you to join me today as we celebrate 34 years of a pastor being with the church as we listen to a sermon from 2015 from the Dr. Eugene Gibson, senior pastor at the place of the outpouring at Olivet Fellowship Memphis. Please join us for worship. Come on, this is the last service and we might as well go ahead. If the Lord has done anything for you that you could not do for yourself, you pressed your way at noon to come out and do it, well go ahead and do it. Don't wait for somebody to say something. Don't wait for the next song. Don't wait for the next chord. But let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Come on, the Lord has done it. Now you do it. Open up your mouth. And bless the name of our Lord. Yeah! Yeah! Yeah, 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 yeah! My God! Whoa! Do me a favor, grab the hand of one person next to you and tell them one thing that God did for you this week that you couldn't do for yourself. Just one, don't, don't tell too many things, just... Tell him just one thing. My, my, my. Now you got two shouts. You can shout for what the Lord did for you. But you can shout for what he did for your neighbor. Come on, bless the name of the Lord. You might as well go ahead and get you about 30 seconds. Can we give him 30 seconds? One, two, one, two, three, go. See where the real praises are. The music stop, but you still clapping. Where y'all at? The folk that don't need no music. I'm looking for you. Where you at? There you go. There it is. Let's do it old school like this. I, I got a praise, I got a praise, and I gotta get it out. I got a praise. I guess that answered my question. I asked Pastor, I said, what's this 12 o'clock crowd like? I, my question is answered. My God, grab the hand of the person next to you.
God, we thank you for the gracious opportunity of sharing. Thank you, oh God, for your loving kindness that David said was better than life. Thank you, God, for the opportunity and exercise of worship, for the ability to press ourselves to the house of prayer and praise just one more time. For this, your fourth worship service at this local praise station. For dancers that danced every service. For choir members that sang every service. For musicians and ushers that were on point every service. For media that has made worship easy every service. And then, God, for people who came just to worship. They didn't have a particular role, but they came just to say, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We give you glory. For this man's servant that you have placed in this house, for 29 years of service to this place we thank you for his wonderful wife who stands at his side and ministers to him even after he's done ministering to the people for wonderful daughters who do not bring shame to the house we say in the language of antiquity much obliged now, God, it's preaching time. You told me a long time ago if I'd open up my mouth, you'd speak for me. I'm going to open up my mouth, Lord, and I'm expecting a miracle. To the soul of the mind, the heart, and the spirit, so that the seed planted today can fall on good soil. With proper care, it can go into a fruit-bearing tree. In the words of the psalmist, I need you now. Bless this message, this moment, and even this man, not because the preacher deserves it, but because the people desire it. Lord, pour so much oil on my head that the ground beneath my feet would be wet. Give us information for our head, illumination for our heart, and inspiration for our hand. And Lord, if you'd be so kind, send the preacher now. And we won't cease to give your name, praise, honor, and glory. That's already do it. For it's in the strong name of Jesus we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. Come on, put your hands together just one more time. 12 o'clock. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. To God our Father, Jesus our Redeemer, the Holy Spirit our Keeper, to the ancestors on shoulders who which we stand, on which we stand, that we might hear have a clearer view and be able to have farther and further vision. To the angel of this house, for now 29 years, my dear friend and big brother, come on, put your hands together for Dr. F. Bruce Williams. And help me celebrate his lovely wife, Dr. Michelle Williams. We bless God for him. We bless God for his ministry in this place, for his love for this people. Bless God for his humility as he serves. You, you and I both have met people with far less with more arrogance than your pastor has y'all didn't get it amen but with all that he has and all that he has done he still is humble and down to earth and we bless god for him and i i thank god for allowing him for allow me to hang around simply because the crumbs from his table still got the same recipe as the cake on the table and if all we can do is eat the crumbs, God, we bless you, God, for you, what you do. For this awesome music ministry, come on, put your hands together. They sang four times. My folk be tired after two times, which means somebody got to get fired when I get back home. I'm joking, I'm joking, but they have blessed me. And I told pastor, I said, it seems like the tired, more tired they get, the better they sound. 
They are working y'all to death in this place. And for our two soloists on that last song, they were singing that thing. Amen. Bless God for them. And I love coming here. And I love the fourth service so much. You know why I love the fourth service? Because it's the last service. I don't even know what you pay my brother, but y'all need to give him a raise. Because it is absolutely insanity to do four services on a weekend. Y'all looking at me funny. I'm up here, my lungs hurt right now. That's why I'm talking slow. Ask him, I ain't talk this slow at no other service. I'm slow right now because my lungs hurt, amen. <laughs> and the thing about Bruce, you have to preach four different sermons when you come here, amen. So I've been here several times, y'all know that. So like all my best stuff, I already preached. So, Leo, I'm just trying one out. <laughs> That's funny to me. You don't have to laugh. That's hilarious to me. Here we go. Here we go. Book of Mark. The book of Mark. But y'all got some of the baddest musicians y'all ever going to find anywhere. Baddest musicians. Sheridan and Anthony and the rest. I don't know everybody's name. The bass player is like insane. He's just insane with it. And I'm, I'm sure, did you mention his album? Okay, I'm going I'm to I'm go pick it up. I'm going to pick it up. Amen. Because he did something. I didn't even know fingers could move that fast. I'm, Mark 10, 10th chapter of Mark. And it, I didn't say this at any other service because I just forgot I was so happy. But my church and I did an EP. If y'all want to check it out, look it up on iTunes. Dr. Geno Gibson in the place of the outpouring. Uh, Anthony and them said it was hot. Sheridan said it was hot. So that means it's hot. Amen. It means it's hot. So pick it up. I'd like, I do like two songs on it. So check it out. It's going to be pretty good. It's going to be pretty good. Uh, Mark 10, 46. One of the things I love here about Bates too is that your pastor is one of the best preachers in the country. I don't say that simply because he's my friend. Bruce, when I was in seminary, I had his proverbial preaching poster on my wall. No, seriously, he'll tell you for 20 years we've been friends almost, and I've told him that from the first time I heard him, I have never heard anybody articulate the word of God like your pastor does. Amazing, 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 amazing. And one of the things, you guys have mature ears, which means that people probably have told him it's hard to preach here because your cheap stuff don't work. Amen. And another thing I like about y'all is that y'all know when to listen and you know when to shout. Worst thing in the world is to go to a church that shouts when they're supposed to be listening and listening when they're supposed to be shouting. In the words of the comic theologian Cat Williams, that ain't the same. So I'm glad you guys do that because the first part of this, we're going to be listening, but we're going to be digging. And then the last part of this, we're going to get our shout on. Is that all right? It says this, they came to Jericho and he is in, and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho. Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And the blind man said, saying to him, Take heart. They called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, my teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. Some translations say on the road. I want to preach with the aid and assistance of the Holy Spirit as well as your prayers, the search for significance. The search 
for significance. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. The search, Bruce, I'm so excited. I don't preach this nowhere else. I preach it at Reggie's church in here. I love this. The search for significance. All men want to matter. All men want to matter. This was never made clearer to me than in 2004 as I was sitting in a packed movie theater there to see the blockbuster war epic about the Trojan War entitled Troy. Starring Brad Pitt as the legendary Athenian-born warrior named Achilles, the movie spoke a timeless truth to the core of my soul, and that truth was that all men want to matter. You see, while Achilles was practicing for his epic battle against Hector of Troy, a fighter known for defeating all of his foes, a young lad who was simply in awe of Achilles asked the question, Achilles, sir, how do you prepare to fight such a warrior as Hector? How do you get your mind ready to engage him in battle? Achilles said, well, man, I'm a warrior and I've been fighting since the days of my youth. It's what I do and I have defeated hundreds of opponents. And the boy said, well, are you not scared to fight him? I mean, I know I wouldn't fight him because I would be too afraid. Without answering the boy's question of fear, Achilles said to the young young man and that is why no one will ever remember your name the boy walked away with his head down embarrassed and defeated indeed all men want to matter in fact let me change that all people want to matter in a real sense we all like that young boy we fear not being significant you see to be significant literally is defined as the quality of having meaning to have significance means that you are of importance that you are a variable that matters in life's equation and I dare say that all of us at the core of our humanity not only want to matter and be significant, but we also want to know that others feel that way about us. We want to know that we are significant to the lives of others. We long to be significant. We are searching for significance to know that we matter, trying not to live life without live, leaving a mark on somebody else's life. Because to do so, to live a life that doesn't matter one that is not significant is one of the most profound fears in the entire world that's why many of us if we're truthful have spent an inordinate amount of time trying to select people and places that will make sure that we seem or at least look significant in fact many times we are searching for that moment and in some cases that series of moments that will produce in us a feeling that let us know that this thing is worth it. This hard work that I do is worth it. These classes that I'm taking are worth it. This study that I'm doing is worth it. This degree that I'm achieving is worth it. This saving money is worth it. This sacrificing is worth it. This Bible study is worth it. This prayer life is worth it. We're looking for something to let us know that all the crying I do at night is not for nothing. I mean... I'm, I ain't going to lie to you. As a man, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to know that I'm more than just a bill payer. As a woman, I know you need to know that you're more than just someone's wife or more than just someone's mom. I mean, I love my daughters, but I want to be more than just a father. I like being a pastor, but I want to be more than just being a pastor. I want to live a life that somebody remembers my name. And though I was not able to interview him, I think this must way and describe the deepest groanings of the heart of this blind son of Timaeus as he prepared for this day that morning in Jericho. I mean, can't you see his mother waking him up early as she did every morning, making sure that he had all that he needed to do his daily duty for the family? As mentioned, he was a blind boy, which means that he could not work because in a real sense, as we're pulling on Shout Boulevard, in a real sense, his, light has, his life has been darted 
guarded by the dimness of despair. He has a stick to help him tap the road in front of him. He has a lunch probably and a water bottle for his long day under the hot desert sun. He even possibly has a sign that says we'll work for food. All of the equipment that a beggar would need for his days of work. You do know that in these days if you had some type of impairment you were forced into the margins of life because number one your impairment would be seen as a result of some sin and displeasement of God and though you would not have to move out of the community like those with the contagious disease of leprosy you still would not be allowed to partake in worship nor would you be allowed to work and as a result the life of one who was blind was just like this young man watch this pastor this young man who Matthew and Luke decided not to even name and Mark does not even give us his actual name Mark give us, gives us Bartimaeus which is not the boy's name we thought for years his name was blind Bartimaeus that ain't his name Bar means son Timaeus is his daddy's name so once again we are looking at someone who is living a life that seemingly is so insignificant that none of the gospel writers record his name a life that is forced into an existence of sitting by the roadside begging and like I suggested earlier this day most likely was this day was not especially different did not carry much more of a meaning than the average old morning I mean nothing seemed out of the ordinary nothing seemed important and nothing seemed in, uh, significant about this day like every other day he woke up blind gathered his belongings and followed his friends fellow beggars if you will down to their space and place in the margins of life down to their spot of ground on the side of the road that leads from Jericho to Jerusalem he sets up as usual expecting nothing more than of the same this seems to be all life has to offer him a dark life in which he's never seen the light of day and his only hope came through appealing to the hearts that were attached to the voices and the feet that were on their way to Jerusalem, either trading, working, or worshiping. Now, we know that it had to be a hard lot in life to be there on the side of the road begging every day, day in and day out. Well, how do you know that, Reverend? Well, first of all, all of us in here that are sighted cannot imagine what it's like to be in a place where you can feel the sun, but you cannot see the sun. But it has to be tough because it's not safe out there on this road from Jericho to Jerusalem. It's not safe out there, especially for a blind dude on the side of the road. You do realize that this is the same road, Jericho to Jerusalem, one that was so famed for bandits and thieves that Jesus, in order to teach your truth, used a parable that we call a Good Samaritan parable where he talks about the gangs and the bandits who were used to jack people on this road but here he is as usual in the margins of life on the side of the road nothing of import happening that day nothing out of the ordinary and this and what is also normal is the feeling deep within his members of fear that his life would not be more significant than that of a roadside beggar but that could be no further than the truth but the suspense of the moment begs us to ask a question. How do you prepare for life's significant moments? I mean, what do you do to get ready for the moments of life that are watershed, life-changing events that will shift the trajectory of your entire life, especially when you have no idea that the moment is coming? More, more significant question would be, and I would love to ask Bartimaeus, but he didn't return my text. How do you prepare for significant moments that are wrapped in an envelope of the ordinary? How do you not miss the moment? Well, let me push it one more low and I'm done. Some of the big players in here, one more low. Here we go. Listen. How do others who affect your life significantly prepare for that moment? 
Because Jesus on the same day had been having a normal teaching day. He was teaching all over on his way to the Passover celebration in Jerusalem. He, of course, was traveling with some of his closest companions, disciples, if you will. And they had traveled from Galilee and now they are moving through the region of Perea. He has spoken all day in parables. He talked about the persistence of the widow. He took to get her creditors to treat her fairly. One about the Pharisee and the tax collector. Jesus had a moment in which he showed his followers how the kingdom of heaven was was when he said he looks like children remember he said suffer little children let them come unto me then things got real because a wealthy young man came and asked Jesus what do I need to do to inherit eternal life and Jesus told him some things to do and the dude got smug with Jesus and said well I already do that and the dude says this he says well sell all your stuff give the money to the poor and then come and follow me. And the Bible says that the rich young ruler left upset because he could not part with the stuff and he could not follow Jesus. Now we about to shout because I've been preaching the last 13 minutes to get to this part. I'm going to slow it down. I'm going to promise it'll change your life and then we're going to shout because the, in essence, I agree with what? Paul David Tripp, get that name, Paul David Tripp. He wrote a book called Dangerous Calling. His name is Paul David Tripp. He wrote a book called Dangerous Calling. He says this, in our search for significance, we seek to find significance and worth in things with assigned worth and not inherent worth. So we seek significance in things that has worth by the world's standards and not by God's standards. All right, y'all not walking with me. Okay, if you got a hundred dollar bill in front of you, it's only worth a hundred dollars, not because the paper it's on is worth a hundred dollars, but it's worth a hundred dollars because the government said it's worth a hundred dollars. So it has assigned worth and not real worth. Y'all ain't get it. Okay. We try to drive better cars, but what makes better cars better cars is that somebody told us they were better cars. And if the truth is that we only need a car to get from point A to point B, then the truth is why are we spending more for better cars, especially if better cars aren't necessarily better cars because better cars always break down because they, we want to, they want to make us buy parts that are better because they cost more. So they're making money because we are on assigned worth and not inherent worth. And it's messed up because oftentimes in our community, we attach our self-esteem to the stuff we have. And when we attach our self-esteem to the stuff we have, and the stuff we have doesn't have any real worth, it only has a sign worth, then it means that our self-esteem is based on something that's controlled by who's ever assigning the worth. Y'all not getting it. Okay, all right. I was in Vegas, right? Don't be looking at me, D. You done been to Vegas before. Don't look at me because I've been to Vegas. I ain't even going to tell you what I did. Because what happens in Vegas, I knew y'all been to Vegas. I knew y'all been to Vegas. So I was in Vegas, right? I was in Vegas with my wife, and we were going, I was going to buy her a Louis Vuitton, amen? I'm going to buy her a Louis. So we walking in Vegas down the shops at the Caesars in Vegas. I'm going to buy her a Louis Vuitton. I got about $500 in my pocket, so I'm going to go get her a Louis Vuitton. And see, some of y'all are groaning already because y'all been to Louis Vuitton, but y'all didn't call me before I went to Louis Vuitton. Y'all would have helped me from being embarrassed way up in Louis Vuitton. I walk in there big and bad with my $500 in my pocket. And I said, yo, ma'am, how much is that purse? She said, 2500 I said, not that one. <laughs> I was talking about something else. I know I wasn't talking about that one. I said, well, show me what I can get for about $500. She took me to the wallets and the keychains, 
and stuff like that. So I'm embarrassed because I wasn't a wallet and a key change. I wanted to get a purse. So we, we, we leaving. I'm a little down. I was like, babe, you know what happened? Because all of the people in Chicago, where we from, and Memphis, where we live, probably in Louisville too, they all got Louis Vuittons. My wife said, oh, that's easy. She said, those are fakes. I said, they excited about something that's fake? You mean to tell me you getting excited and walking around like your stuff don't stink and your stuff ain't even real? And I believe God is tired of fakes in church. I believe God is tired of people that are knockoffs in church. I believe that God is looking for some people that are real enough that say, my stuff might not be magnificent. My stuff might not be splendid. You might not even like my stuff, but guess what, boo-boo? It is real. And you can walk around with fake praise if you want to, walk around with knockoffs if you want to, but when I lift my hands, it's real. When I do my dance, it's real. When I give him glory, it's real. I dare you to grab somebody's hand and shake it like you're going to shake it off and say, my stuff is real. We're dealing. Huh? Yeah, I feel like preaching now. We're dealing on, listen, not stuff that has inherent worth but stuff that has assigned worth. That's why we watch all these non-reality reality shows. How you gonna watch the Real Housewives of Atlanta? Ain't none of them married, and ain't none of them got a house. Assigned, assigned worth. As a result, we, we meet, date, fall in love, and most likely many times fall out of love because we based it on assigned worth or superficial stuff that will fade. We base significance of our life and whether, on whether we are successful or not on how many things we can acquire that have assigned value. And more often than times, I'm in the text because your, your pastor is a patroller of the text. And more times than not, we miss a moment filled with inherent significance by missing the value. Watch this. The man walks away from Jesus when Jesus in essence says, if you want significance of being with me, you must be willing to sacrifice the stuff that has assigned value, worth, and significance. And it's as this moment ends, I'm still in the text, that the disciples and the group with Jesus are discussing among themselves. And Jesus begins to teach a lesson of significance. He talks about how hard it is for a rich man or woman to enter into heaven. Please, does not, this does not mean that saints can't have nice stuff. It doesn't mean just because you saved, you can't make no money. Amen. Y'all see, somebody should have shouted right there. I like nice stuff, amen. I'm a nice stuff liker, amen. So I want some, I want some nice stuff in my life. It ain't how you, it's not, it's, not, it's not having nice stuff. Your stuff cannot control you. You can make some money. It ain't about making money. It's what you do with the money and how you help others with the riches that you, that you acquire. Jesus says, Jesus says that it's hard for a rich man to get into heaven. And, and Peter says, well, God, we left everything. I like Peter. Peter was a gangster. Peter, Peter was a gangster. Y'all like, be deep. You, you know, I, I, see, I, I don't like Christians that get all hemmy. You know, hemmy, time you get saved, you like you set your ringtone to some hymns. I don't like saved saints like that. When you sit next to me and your phone go off, I don't want to hear, great is thy faithful man. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. I'm an R. Kelly fan. I want to hear backyard party. I want to hear some of that. That's what I, y'all act like y'all don't know who R is. <laughs> I'm going to pray for y'all. Peter was a gangster though. I love Peter. Peter was a gangster. You know how I know he's a gangster? Peter took a knife to the prayer meeting. 
And see, some of y'all should have helped me a little bit more because if I searched you right now, there's something in your pocket, something on your person. I know you praying, but everybody don't close their eyes when the prayer go down. I understand. Peter brags, God, we left everything to hang with you. And it starts a commotion. I'm almost done. It starts the commotion. And when the commotion starts, Mark says that while the commotion is going on, they turn on their final leg into Jerusalem. And when they turn on their final leg in Jerusalem, they have to go through Jericho. And with the group growing and the sound getting louder, and they start to come through the city on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, that's when a normal day gets really significant y'all not walking with me that's when the normal day got significant because as they enter the city of Jericho Bartimaeus could hear them getting louder you remember Bartimaeus is on the side of the road that leads from Jerusalem to Jericho and he hears a noise that is louder can't you see him asking his boy yo butter I don't know if his friend's name was butter I just made that up yo butter Say, yeah, what's going on on the road? Look down there and see it for me. Say, why you ask me to do that? He said, because it's too loud for a regular Thursday. Something is going on on the road. He said, man, it's a crowd down there. Brother Mass looked back at him and said, man, Stevie Wonder, Ray Charles, and me can see there's a crowd. me what's going on but a look he said oh that's Jesus of Nazareth stop right there because it's about to get good real quick get good real quick look at your neighbors and say, here it come look at that was the wrong neighbor look at another one and say here it come he said that's Jesus of Nazareth and when somebody told him it was Jesus of Nazareth it was something that was in him that knew that this day wasn't normal no more. <laughs> it was something that was in him that made him know that his search for significant and, and over when they said, oh, that's Jesus of Nazareth. And there's three things that you need to know if you're going to have your search for significance, if you're not going to be caught up in things with assigned worth versus thing with an er inherent worth, there are three things you need to know. Number one, this is going to shout your pastor. Number one is insight is better than eyesight. Insight is better than eyesight. Insight is better than eyesight. What, what Mark does here that's absolutely brilliant, he compares the rich young ruler to blind Bartimaeus. The ruler has eyesight, the ruler has resources, and he realized what Jesus can do. Jesus was a teacher. He could give him answers to his questions, so he asked what he needed to know, and when he didn't get the answer that he wanted, he left the man, left Jesus, and went back to where he came from. This is not the case with Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus was blind. He could not see. He had no resources. He had no eyesight, but he did have insight. You know how I know? Watch this. They, he said, who is on the road? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. When he heard it was Jesus of Nazareth, he said, Jesus, son of David. You missed it. He said, who's on the road? They said, oh, it's Jesus of Nazareth. When he heard it was Jesus of Nazareth, he yells out, Jesus, son of David. You still didn't get it. Who, who be on the road, dog? It's Jesus of Nazareth. He yells out, Jesus, son of David. What you have to understand is that Jesus of Nazareth is a geographical placement, but Jesus of Nazareth is a messianic distinction. Jesus of Nazareth was where he was from, but Jesus, son of David, was who he was. It trumped where he was from because he knew who he was. I have a question, y'all. Bates, help me out. 
How'd he know who Jesus was if he ain't never seen Jesus? Because he was blind. If he's never seen him, how'd he know who he was? I heard you behind me say, he must have heard about him. Well, will you help me preach? What did he hear about him? Did he hear he had healed the sick? Did he hear that he had unstopped deaf ears? Maybe he heard that, maybe he heard that he raised the dead. Possibly he knew some of his cousins that was at that fish fry. You remember that fish fry when he took two fish and, and five loaves of bread? And the amazing thing is they had more after than they had in the beginning. Or maybe he heard about the miracle that he needed. That Jesus gave sight to the blind. Whatever the case, what shouts me is that he got excited because he had heard about Jesus. And what gets me excited about that, Dr. Michelle, is many of us in here don't have to hear about Jesus because we've seen Jesus work in our lives. And if he could get excited about hearing about Jesus, I wonder if there's 200 people in here right now that can get excited about what Jesus has done in your life just this week. I mean, is there anybody here? Don't fool me now. They can get excited enough to give God some praise simply because what he did for you last Monday, what he did for you last Tuesday, what he did for you last Wednesday, any Thursday shadows in here, any Friday shadows in here, anybody that can bless God for yesterday, but there's one or two of y'all that can look at your watch and say, the Lord is blessing me right now, and I'm going to give him some praise. Second thing is this, not only does my insight outweigh my eyesight, but the second thing is my desperation trumps my discretion. <laughs> my desperation trumps my discretion. Because when he started yelling, there were some folk that wanted to main the, maintain the order thereof. And they wanted to let him know how uncouth it was for him to be, watch this, yelling from the side of the road to folk who were on the road. Everybody know that you are not qualified if you're on the side of the road to address those of us that are on the road. Because if you're on the road, you're only on the road because you're going to work or you're going to worship. And anybody on the side of the road is not allowed to work or worship and as a result, they are disqualified from yelling anything to somebody that's on the road, especially Jesus. And they were right. They were right. I mean, he was uncouth. He's on the side of the road. He was a nuisance even, and they told him to shut up. And we know that's what society does. We know how they treat people who are on in the margins and not worthy of the road. I mean, look at the systemic ways they treat folk that on the side of the road with miseducation and lack of education and poor education. They treat you like you're on the side of the road through mass incarceration, food deserts, and unfair wages, unemployment, and underemployment because you're on the side of the road. They won't even allow computers in the schools in the hood, but they have all kinds of stuff out in the suburbs on the side of the road. But the truth of the matter is, many of us save folk in church. We treat people like they on the side, side of the road. I mean, with your saved road self, treating people like they non-road people. I mean, 
don't go to jail, you know, don't, don't have done some time and try to get back into the society with us. We got to remind you of what it is. We're going to let you be to the church, but we're going to watch security and put it on you because not too long ago, you was on the side. I mean, don't have several different babies, you know, by several different fathers, you know. That side of the road behavior. I can't get no help. And we do stupid stuff in church. The girl in the choir gets pregnant by the drummer. We put her out the choir, but the drummer can still drum. That side of the road. What's up, dog? You got, you got, yeah. Uh, uh, don't get AIDS. We'll remind you that you're not much more than a modern day leper. Don't get hooked on drugs. Nah. Don't become an uh, alcoholic or nothing, which means if you're an alcoholic, you probably only drink one more than us, you know. <laughs> Don't be from the wrong community. Don't be gay or lesbian. Don't do that in us as church. Unless you can play or direct the choir, then we'll pimp you for your gift. He's on the side of the road. They tell him, shut up. Jesus ain't got time for you. But y'all, he could see, he could see the potential of this opportunity. <laughs> he, he could see what was stirring up there. And he waited. He was like, okay, discretion, acting like they want me to act, or desperation. I mean, I've been on the side of the road for a long time, and Jesus ain't never came by here before, and I don't know his itinerary. I don't know when he might be coming back again. So do I just get quiet, or do I yell louder than them? Say, I gotta yell louder, because they loud yelling at me. Jesus! Yeah. Yeah. Son of David! Yeah. Have mercy on me, my God. Watch what happens. He basically said, before I take it back, I'm going to add some more to it. And what shouts some of us in here is that you've had a moment of desperation where you needed God to move on your behalf. You ain't got time to listen to Negroes around you telling you you need to be quiet because they don't know what you're going through. They don't know how bad it's hurting. You just have to say, Father, I stretch my hands to thee. You yell out whatever you need to yell out when you need to yell it out. Desperation outweighed discretion. Here's the crazy thing. The Bible says, few of y'all, this is going to shout you. Maybe not. Huh. Bible says, when Jesus heard him, he stopped on the road. <laughs> there was a yell from off the road and when Jesus heard the yell from off the road while he was on the road he stopped on the road it messes me up Jesus says <laughs> go get him And 
tell them I said, come to me. You mean the blind dude? How's the blind dude going to get to Jesus? jacket real quick because all I have is a t-shirt under here and it's soaked the man <laughs> watch he's there begging he's got a cloak because he's begging and everybody know when you beg you got a cloak why because that's where they put the money in the cloak he's sitting there he can't see. But he hears some folk on the road. He ain't on the road because he's in the margins of life. But he hears somebody says, tell him to come to me. He's blind. Now what you shout y'all is who was Jesus telling to bring him to Jesus? He was telling the same people who had been telling him to shut up the whole time. And isn't it amazing that God can turn that thing around? That the very folk that told you God wasn't interested in you, that God didn't want to use you, are the same folk that got to give you the blessing and escort you right to Jesus. Got his cloak. The money is there. He's already proven that insight is better than eyesight. Already proven that his desperation outweighs his discretion. But this is the one that's really going to mess you up. Jesus tells him to come here. Now he has to make a decision. Because his cloak is full of the money full of the money that he left home to come get. He didn't know he was going to run into Jesus, but he left home to get the money. But when Jesus said, come here, he had a decision to make. Am I going to keep the money or am I going to run? Wait a minute. This has assigned worth, but Jesus has inherent worth. So you know what happened? He threw the cloak. Yeah. Coins. Yeah. Going everywhere. Yeah. And Jesus asks him a question. I'm about to hurt somebody with this question. Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? Here it is. When Jesus asks you that question, in your search for significance, French, this is going to mess you up. You must tell God what you want, really. Notice I didn't say what you really want. Because what you want, really, is different than what you really want. You really want a job, a better job. But what you want really is to feel significant. You really want to be married. 
But what you want really is not to be lonely. God said, be quiet for a minute. I had to let that marinate. Too many times we fill our lives with what we really want. God says, tell me what you want. Really, watch this. God says, because I already know. I already know the depth to which the hurt goes, God says. Quit coming to me with stuff you really want when I want to touch you where you want, really. The man really wanted a good day begging for money. But what he wanted, really, what he wanted, really, was to see. Here it is. The Bible says, Jesus says your faith has made you whole. Watch. And immediately he was healed and joined Jesus. (laughs) He joined Jesus on the road. Which means, and this would be a whole other sermon, which means Jesus, because he told him what he wanted really, always has the prerogative to upgrade you. Last thing and I'm done. Last thing and I'm done. The problem with many of us, the problem with many of us, Sheridan, I'm ready. The problem with many of us Is simply this. We ask God for what we really want because we don't think we're worthy of what we want really. So we address issues around what we want really and masquerade because we're scared we're not worth Is this making any sense? Our search for significance ends when we have the courage to tell God what we want really. Because God still thinks you're worth it. God still thinks that you're worth loving, that you're worth giving. You're working in church, but you don't feel worth it. You're singing in the choir, you don't feel worth it. You're on the door as an usher, you don't feel worth it. You're behind the pulpit and you don't feel worth it. And God says, you're still worth it to me. God says, you're worth it. In fact, encourage your neighbor, just grab him real quick and say, you're worth it. Look at another neighbor and say, you're worth it. Yeah, you have been through some things. You're not shining like you used to shine, but, but you're still worth it. If you believe that, come on, give God some praise in here. Come on, give the Lord some glory. In fact, in fact, go ahead and praise him until that low self-esteem falls off. Praise him until your wealth, your worth increases. Praise him until you feel better about who you are. You thought I was worth saving So you came into my life You thought I was worth keeping (laughs) So you cleaned me up inside You thought I was to die for So you sacrificed your life So I can be free So I can be whole So I can tell everyone I know You thought I was 
was worth saving so you came into my life you thought I was worth keeping so you cleaned me up inside you thought I was to die for my mind so you sacrificed your life so I can be free so I can be whole so I can tell we hope and pray that you've been blessed by today's message and we're excited to extend an invitation for you to become a Christian, a devoted follower of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in John chapter 3 verses 16 and 17, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. If you want to be saved and have new life in Jesus Christ, pray this prayer, Lord, I confess that I'm a sinner and I'm sorry for my sins. Forgive me of all of my sins, Lord. I turn away from my old life and turn now to you. I believe that because your son, Jesus, died on the cross for my sins, I am indeed forgiven. Now, God, I surrender my life to you and by faith, I receive Jesus Christ and accept him as Savior, Lord, and leader of my life. Thank you for forgiving my sins. Thank you for the gift of the Spirit, and thank you for giving me brand new life in Jesus Christ. Lord, I am forever yours. Amen. Now that you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it is important that you become a part of a Christian fellowship. If you want to become a part of Base Memorials Church, you can call the number on the screen now and someone will be there to share with you how you can become a part of our fellowship. If you're already a follower of Jesus but wish to become a member of Base Memorial, you too can call the number on the screen and those on the line will give you information about how you can become a member of Base Memorial. If you desire prayer, go to our website, basememorial.com, click prayer, or you can call the number on our screen. We'll be waiting for you. Supper. It is the time we come together to commemorate and remember the great sacrifice that our Lord made so that we might have a right to the tree of life, how he died for a moment so that we could live forever. This is not my table. This is not base memorial's table. This is the Lord's table. And the Lord bids all those who've been born twice to come and to die. Paul said, for I've received of the Lord that which also I give unto you, that on the night in which our Lord was betrayed, he took bread, broke it, and passed it, and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. After the same manner also, he took the cup after he had supped, and said, this is the New Testament in my blood, drink ye all of it. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do so show forth his death till he comes again. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for this radical love you've shown by giving your son to save our souls, fix our hearts, and transform our lives. Father, we thank you for your son's willingness to do this on humanity's behalf. We ask your blessings over the bread, a symbol of his body broken that we might be made whole, and the cup, a symbol of his blood or life poured out. We might have life and have it more abundantly. Lord, you didn't have to do it, but you did. And for that, oh God, we give you thanks. And for that, we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on.
You now take your elements. Let us all eat and drink together. Amen. Wasn't that a great sermon? I hope it blessed you like it blessed me. As you know, giving is a part of worship. And so now as we have been blessed, as God has given us a message through his messenger, it's our turn to now give back unto God a portion of that which he has given to us. And so with that being said, I want you to listen to a message from my own pastor, Dr. F. Bruce Williams. We're able to provide this word for you through this medium as a consequence of very faithful disciples who are members of Base Memorial Baptist Church and a growing number of people who consider themselves friends of Base Memorial. They give and we try our best to make it as convenient as possible to give. And maybe you want to join either the church or you want to join that group of faithful givers. And there's several ways you can give. You can give by cash app, dollar sign base memorial. You can go online, basememorial.com and click onto the giving tab and give. You can give uh, by text, information should be on the screen, or you can just drop by and drop off your tithes offering and sacrificial giving, a special gift, and we'll make sure it gets where it's supposed to get. If none of those things work, don't worry. We take snail mail too, so you can just mail it in at Base Memorial 620, that's 620 East Lampton Street, Louisville, Kentucky, 40203, and we promise you it will get where it's supposed to get. God. As you know, we never like to end any worship experience without a prayer and a benediction. With that being said, please bow your head with me as we pray. Father God, we thank you for this yet another day which you've allowed us to see and be a part of. We thank you, Lord, for this word. We thank you, Lord, for what our eyes have seen, our ears have heard, and our hearts have felt. We pray now, Lord, that as we have heard the word, that it has absorbed into our innermost beings, so that now, and as we prepare to go out into the world, we may be able to be a witness unto you, to let what it is we've heard come out in a way to where as it glorifies your name and edifies your people. And we'll be ever careful to give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now receive this benediction. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, to present us faultless before his presence with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Father, through Christ Jesus be all glory, dominion, power, and majesty, now and henceforth and forevermore. Let us all say, Amen.